of the storm. You remain in control. Is he in control of your life? Amen. Amen. You know, as Dr. Josh was mentioning about the uh, things in the bulletin coming up, one of them that I'm really excited about, and it just transpired this past week, is uh, a baby dedication we're going to do in September. And it's going to be altogether different. Uh, Peggy and I were with our grandchildren down at the Ark on Monday, and I received a text asking, uh, this was from four different families that had gotten together and said, hey, we've had new babies and we want to dedicate our children. And I was thinking, well, there's so much more than these four because we've had babies just being born everywhere around here, it seems like. And uh, when I got back, I talked to Marcia, and I think we have 14 families uh, since I did the last dedication that either have a new child or have come into our church where they have an infant. And uh, I think that's awesome. And The most exciting part about it is while I was there, God, I felt, spoke to me and said, you do this one different. So this dedication is going to be totally different. It's going to be one where it's going to be interactive of the parents. And uh, and I'll share that with you once we find out who else is going to be there. So, But if you do have a baby or a child that has not been dedicated, I want to encourage you to do that. Amen. Amen. You know, raising children can be a scary thing for sure. Believe me, even if they're older, it's, it's scary. And it's really scary when you have grandchildren and you wonder what's going to happen. Have any of you ever been scared before? Any of you? Really? I want to illustrate it by telling this story. Uh, there was a situation where a little boy found himself. He had diligently rehearsed for his role in the Easter play. His one and only line was, It is I, be not afraid. It is I, be not afraid. On the day of the program, he was a nervous wreck and his stomach churned and you know what that's like sometimes as his teacher reviewed the line with him one more time backstage. Finally, he stopped in front of the, the glaring lights and he looked out and he saw the silhouettes of his peers and the audience and he panicked and his mind went blank. Can you put yourself there? So he blurted out, It's me, and I'm scared to death. (laughs) Maybe a storm of a different kind, but a storm no less. I've experienced a lot of storms in my life, and I can remember as a young boy growing up, I loved thunderstorms. Now, some of you don't. The booming and the cracking and the lighting up of the sky, the one thing that... A thunderstorm adds to the equation, though, is that electrical effect, the uh, shock that comes. They tell me, as I look through uh, the statistics this week, that if you live to be an average age, you have 1 in 12,000 chance to be hit by lightning sometime in your lifetime. And I thought about that. One person in Wapak can expect to get that. Did you know when I was younger, I was taught how you could count the number of seconds between the flashing of the lightning and the roaring of the thunder and then divide by five and you can find the distance and how many miles of that lightning. So meaning that if it's five seconds between, it's a mile. And if it's 15 seconds, it's three miles. And if it's zero seconds, you can imagine it's very close. So if you're going to be counting Those kind of things, make sure you know where you're at when you're counting, especially if those zeros come along. I'm not a meteorologist, but I've lived long enough to know a little bit about what many call Mother Nature and how she delivers her impact on at least the physical earth. I know there are falling barometric pressures, uh, the impacts and the differentials in storms and the way temperatures go up and down, the way fronts move around our globe. The tracking of a storm can be very unpredictable, though, about the time they think they know exactly what's going to happen. I remember last week, we thought it was going to rain all day on Thursday, and it just did some different things, and you can't believe all of the the forecast. But I've also noticed there are front sides of a storm, and there are back sides. And depending on whether the storm is on the land or the sea, the conditions and the winds become very scary. For example, on a landstorm such as a severe thunderstorm, it brings in those tornadic types of clouds, thunder or funnel clouds. 
and sometimes those straight cross line winds. An oceanic or a sea type storm like a typhoon, a cyclone, or a hurricane, they bring in that spinning motion and usually there's a whole lot of flooding that goes along. So I'm trying to just paint the picture a little bit. I found out that there is a place in each storm where the winds are the calmest. I don't know if I could have said any better than Pastor Larry did Wednesday night. If you weren't here, there was some real truth that he was sharing about joy and how joy, when it comes in to your midst, how there's a calmness in your life. And, and I think he was sharing that in the very presence of God is where that calm is and that effect. You know, in a hurricane, it's called the eye. In our physical life, it's called simply peace and quiet. How many likes some peace and quiet? After my grandkids leave, I love peace and quiet. But I love them when they're there, too. In our spiritual life, it is called joy. You know, this morning, I had probably a different phenomenon happen in the last two days. And especially, Peggy just kept giving me name after name because a lot of times she forgets to tell me. But there are more than 20 families that contacted us in some way, and I, I'm, I appreciate you contacting. But I don't really want to know about it on Sunday morning a whole lot, but we're not going to be there. There is this activity, or this is going on, or the fair is here, or a vacation, or just something. And, and my first thought as a pastor was, why do I take the time? Why do I worry? Why do I put together all of these things? But God reminded me this morning, as I was back praying in the office, those of you that are here, you're the one that needs to hear what God has prepared. I believe God knows those things. He has already prepared that. So I'm going to give you what God has shared with me. So for a few moments, I want to share what seems to be a natural event. But God and Jesus intervened in a supernatural way. The lessons I've learned apply to the trials and the tests as they sang in the song. Whether it's your health, whether it's your job, whether it's your family, whether it's people who have deserted you, the circumstances can be resolved when Jesus enters the storm. I want to try and tie the message to three of the most memorable storms. I, I could tell you all kinds of storms. I've lived long enough to experience a lot of storms, but there's three that I want to share with you. So I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 8 this morning. Luke chapter 8. Notice here in, as you're turning that Jesus has just finished ministering to the masses, and yet he decides to cross to the other side. Now, think about this. He could have chosen to go by land, but he chose instead to go by sea. As if he didn't already know the life lesson he was about to teach, he was going to apply a lesson that the disciples had no idea about. Let's face it, storms can be scary, especially when you have no control and especially no safe place to be in. I hear myself cracking a lot here. It's bad enough to experience a storm in a mobile home or an airplane, much less a boat. And I'll share what I mean by some of those. So let's take a look at what the scripture reads here. It says in Luke chapter 8, beginning verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and they started out. As they sailed across, Jesus, down by a nap, settled down by nap, for soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filled with water and they were in danger, real danger. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. The storm stopped and all was calm. Then he asked them, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man, they ask each other, when he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obeyed him. Heavenly Father, this morning, not in a ritual, but because I need you. I need you. This morning, would you allow the words that I speak to be God-driven, God-inspired, god hope words to this congregation. Would you allow the ears of the congregation today, those that are listening, the ones that this applies to, would you allow their ears to be opened and their hearts to be ready? Because God, I'm expecting for you to do 
some calming in the storms of their life. Would you be with us, I pray, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now notice in a summary that Jesus commands them to cross to the other side of the sea. An unordinary storm is about to arise. The intensity of the storm suggests the savagery of Satan. You know, we know that he's out to kill, to steal, and destroy. But sometimes we blame things on everything else but instead of understanding the source. We assume the Lord went to sleep because he was weary. You know, he had a natural body. He had a physical body. So that's what we would assume. So weary that a violent storm would not even touch him or disturb him. The disciples became frightened and felt that everyone in the boat were going to perish. The storm did not disturb the Lord, but the attitude of his disciples did. And you know, there are times where our attitudes toward God when we're in the storm is what really most disturbs him. He rebukes the wind and, and the sea as one would speak, I thought, here to a dog as, as he would say, you know, behave. I tell our dog that sometimes, very authoritative. And that dog, as if I muzzled him, would just stop in its tracks and do nothing. I think that's what Jesus does. The miracle lies in the fact the wind ceased and listen to me, immediately. And the sea which was been rolled up, or it could have been rolled up for hours in a storm, and maybe they would have lost their lives, became just as still as glass as it rolled up like a scroll. How often he puts us in the storms of life in order that we might be closer to him and that we can understand what manner of man that this is. I, uh, I looked at these scriptures, and I want to take them one at a time because there's, there's four verses here, and each one of them spoke to me in a different way. And I want to look at those here. I want you to realize they didn't understand the purpose. Most of the storms we go through, we don't understand the purpose at all. We think that Jesus or God is on some wild goose chase. That's the way I term it because anytime Someone gives me something to do that I don't understand. I say it's a wild goose chase. But here the scripture says, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But, as so but soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filled or filling with water, and they were in real danger. You know that real goose chase or that one that you think that God doesn't know what he's doing. I thought in scripture there were times that I think his disciples didn't know what he was doing. I think of Zacchaeus. You know, Zacchaeus, that heathen sinner, the one that was evidently short. He couldn't see above the crowd. He had to climb up into a tree. And when Jesus told him that I'm going home with you, I'm going to your house, and salvation is going to come to your house, I believe his disciples believe, what are we doing? There is no purpose in this. I thought another story where his disciples, when he's about ready to come into Jerusalem, he says, go get a donkey. Now, if somebody gives me those instructions, now go to a house or go to a place where there's a donkey that's never been ridden. And if someone catches you stealing this donkey, just tell them my master has need of them. I would have thought, you're sending me on a wild donkey chase. Something's different going on here. Or when Peter, the fisherman of all fishermen, when it's time to pay your taxes or whatever, and Jesus says, go get me a fish or, or go find a fish, and he opens up the fish's mouth, and there's a coin for tribute to pay to Caesar. And he tells them, you know, you're supposed to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. At the process where Jesus tells him what to do, I think, God, you don't know what you're doing. This don't make sense. You're not giving the right application for what is really going on. And I thought, well, me and Peggy came to Wapak. You know, I, I could go into a lot of the, the, the memories and sentiments and things, and I don't, I don't want to do that. But the one thing that caught me after I said yes, and I left Honda, and, and the church voted me in, and uh, the only time they'll ever vote on me, because that, that's a good thing. I don't like politics. But I thought how, how great it was to feel God and the sense of his, his presence and understanding and know he had me in the place I was supposed to be. Until about a month and a half later, in, in January, there's a big storm comes through Wapak, and 
and it dumps 10 in- inches of rain in a- overnight. And I didn't know what that All Glaze River was like. I had no idea what it was like. But it came up, and it came up, and it came up until it was in the church. And when we went down there, the stink and the stench and the things and the problems, and, you know, we had primarily an older congregation, elder men, and, and this pastor didn't know anything about construction. We had to tear out the walls and cut the walls and remediate and clean up. And I asked God, you don't know what you're doing, do you? You don't have a clue. What in the world have you got me into? Here the disciples felt that way when that storm became raging. Here's Jesus over there sleeping as if he didn't know what was going on. You know, he wasn't bothered. And they got to be thinking, Jesus, we could have gone by land, but you sent us by sea. You don't know what you're doing. You know, some of you are being sent. You're being asked to do something by God. You're being asked to move. You're being asked to to maybe even go to a different church or, or do something or go into missions, whatever it might be. And your thought is, God, you don't know what you're doing because it doesn't make sense. I want to tell you, there are many things that happen in your life that don't make sense. And now you blame some of them on Satan, but could it be that Jesus is testing, he's trying, he's leading you into something even better? I believe that's what he was doing here with the disciples The scripture reads on here in in, in 23. I think I read that first. But again, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for that nap. The boat was filled with water, and it was a real danger. It was a real storm. Do you know that? It was a real storm. It wasn't make-believe. It wasn't a camouflage. It wasn't something that no one knows anything about. It was real. And I think about this Sea of Galilee or Sea of Gennesaret, that they would call it. You have to understand about this sea. It was about five miles wide and 13 miles long, a small place. And you think, how could such a violent storm come upon this sea? It's also a sea of so many dimensions of fish and variety. I think that's how Jesus spent his time around because he knew the world that he created was going to have a lot of different kinds of people, a variety of fish and things, very deep in consequence of what could take place there. Around it, surrounding this sea, were large mountains where it was cool and even maybe, I don't know if they're, they tell me that there's snow caps at times, but the cool winds, you know what cool winds do when they come down onto a warm sea? They get very violent. That's where your tornadic winds start coming up. And it was a regular thing, not just an abnormal thing for a storm to come up on this sea. Jesus should have known that, shouldn't he? He knew ahead of time that there was going to be a real storm. I think of the real storm that I remember physically. Back in 1978, January 25th in the evening, we were getting all these weather forecasts and we didn't have these phone apps and we didn't have meteorologists you know, giving us instantaneous weather maps. But we were told by radio that there's a big storm coming in. It's a different dimensional storm. It was called the blizzard of 78. And I remember going out and driving. I got groceries and things because I thought, well, you know, you listen to people. You get your your bread and your milk or whatever. I got a few different things because I wasn't a Christian. I wanted to be able to settle in for a storm. And I remember rain just coming down. No big deal. And I thought, pfft. They missed it again, just like they always do. And I remember my brother, my younger brother, I told you about him, that we spent a lot of time doing a lot of things that caused us both pain. I remember him at 3 o'clock in the morning pounding on my door. I lived in a mobile home. And I I couldn't imagine what he was doing there because he was working up in defiance at that time. But he knew that there was some danger And he wanted to come home. He didn't want me to be by myself. I think of that. He didn't want me to be by myself. And as I woke, I was startled. I woke up. I felt my mobile home shaking. It was like it was pumping air in and out. And I looked over and at the foyer by my front door, I had three feet of snow inside my mobile home. I thought, whoa, what is going on? I thought my my furnace was going out. And after I shoveled myself out inside... I opened the door, and there was my brother, and it, 
He don't, I don't know how he got there. Everything was just covered and it was coming down. And for you that are, are, have only read about it or whatever, it's a phenomenon that I'll never forget because that storm was so violent. There was things you couldn't even see through that day and through the next day. It was, you know, at times I think they said that it was the third highest uh, barometric pressure, atmospheric conditions, the third worst in the history of the United States or in on North America. There was tragedy for four or five states. If you don't know, winds, I think, up in Wisconsin got way well over 100 miles an hour. They did even in our area. Up there where there were 40 inches of snow, we didn't get as much snow. But I can remember how traumatic it was. I lived in a little place or a little town that was kind of down in a hole, and the entire town got snowed in. It was a week before the National Guard could get us out. I can remember walking across the streets three or four days later and realize I was walking across cars. I can remember walking to the top of the school and just walking on top of the school. Everything had, had drifted so bad. I thought, it was a real storm. If I was going to tell you about one, that's the real storm. But there have been storms in my life that are even more real. That when I was in the midst of a mess, it wasn't the National Guard that came to help me. It was the Lord himself. 24th verse says, the disciples went and woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. He displayed his power. Here the disciples thought his power was in him saying, Peace be still or, or talking to the storm and having it stop. Immediately the storm stopped. And isn't that what we want as children of God? Immediately the storm to stop. And it doesn't always stop immediately. But the one thing for sure, that Jesus was still there with them. Jesus was around them. He was in the boat with them. You know, there's times where we forget that Jesus is in the boat. He is with us. If we are a child of God, even when we're not, I'm thinking that as I was going through life, I wasn't ready. If that blizzard had have caused death, there were deaths in Ohio. I would have been lost. There wouldn't have been any hope for me. But Jesus was still in the boat. It, it reminds me of a storm where me and Peggy, after we had gotten married in 1980, we got married in 79. In 1980, we still lived in that same mobile home. She moved into my bachelor's pad. And I remember how I had it decorated and <laughs> she says, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. But that storm that came in 1980, in the spring of 1980, on a Saturday morning, it was a violent storm. About 5 o'clock in the morning, Peggy is shuddering. You know, a man is supposed to keep his wife safe and secure and calm down. I had a wife that was not calm. When the winds in that tray, the walls just were, you know, they were going in and out. And, and Peggy, reached, this is my Saturday morning. I work every day. And I'm thinking, woman, leave me alone. Is that even politically correct to say woman? But I was thinking, wife, please leave me alone. I remember mumbling over to her. She says, something bad's happening. Get up, get up. I says, Peggy, I do my praying when the sun shines. I don't need to worry about a storm. I kind of think that's what Jesus was doing in a way. He was thinking, why are you so bothered? No, I think he really cared that his disciples needed him in some way. Sometimes we think we're bothering the Lord. Well, Peggy was bothering me. I waited. You know, I, was, I want you to understand, we were newly married. And newly married people sleep in. And now I understand why they come to second service. <laughs> but about 10 o'clock in the morning, I wake up. And everything's calm and still when we go outside and there's total destruction all around us. A tree that had been the cornerstone shading our mobile home that probably had been around two or three hundred years was uprooted out of its roots, laying everywhere, broken up. All around us and our, our mobile home wasn't touched. There was nothing else going on. And I thought, yeah, I did pray when the sun was shining. I was saved at this time, for sure. And I thought, wow. The Lord protected us, and later we found out there were those straight-line winds. I don't know if it was a tornado, but the entire town was tore apart. 
Now, we didn't live through another storm in that town because Peggy wanted to get out of there, and we did. But I thought, to a new Christian, it is so easy to think about, I'm going to get out of the boat. When I was living for Satan, I didn't have these problems. I didn't have these problems. I didn't have relationship problems. Now my family doesn't want to come around me. I didn't have these medical problems. Suddenly, you know, I thought I'd become a Christian and everything would be perfect. And I'd never have to face an illness again. You know, there are preachers that have propagated this gospel, and that's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't say, you know, you're going to live in rose beds, that everything's going to be pretty and nice. Well, what it says is there's going to be someone in the boat with you. There's going to be someone near you that you can call out and you can depend that he is going to be there. I think there are people that are getting weary. You know, even I think of Christians for a long time. I've watched people that have known God and known his, his power, but they've gotten weary. These disciples, I want you to understand, this wasn't their first rodeo. They had been around Jesus. They'd watched him open blind eyes. They've watched him raise the dead. They watched him do some things already. But they were coming to him, and it really, in a way, it bothered Jesus that they didn't know who was in the boat with them. Now, how in the world do we do that sometimes? We talk to Jesus like you don't know what's happening, do you? Did, did you ever think the way we pray sometimes, we're telling God something that we think he doesn't know? And I realize he says if you have need of something, you're supposed to ask. You knock, and he'll open, and... And you seek him and you'll find him. And he wants us because of our importunity or our shameless persistence to keep asking him. But the way we ask is if he doesn't know what's going on. And we have to understand he does. He sent us on the mission. These disciples had no idea the power that Jesus was releasing and about to release. And they were amazed. Aren't we a Christian sometimes? We know what God can do. You know, a couple healings we had here in church on a Wednesday night two weeks ago. In a way, we acted like it was an abnormal thing when it should be a normal thing. People immediately, there were two that were healed. I, I think it was Ben and, and Greg. Healed immediately. God touched them. And these disciples were amazed about what was going on. But Jesus was thinking in his heart, you don't even know why I sent you on your mission to begin with. You don't even know why we're going by boat to the other side. We're going to the other side because there is a demonic man there. There is somebody that needs, there is a sinner. He's not only a sinner, he's got a thousand devils in him. His name is Legion. He's waiting there and he needs me. The scriptures go on to tell about how the, the devils begin to talk back to Jesus because the scripture, if you look in between, Immediately when they came in the presence of Jesus, they came out of that man. He was no longer talking to the man. He was talking to the devils. And they're saying, give us leave. Don't send us to that bottomless pit. Don't send us down there into the abyss. And he sends them into some hogs. His disciples don't even get this picture. They have no idea why well, I'm sharing that with you right now where you're at, the storm you're in, the place you're in. All you know is that Jesus is with you. And I'm telling you, that's enough. That's enough. If he doesn't give you an answer through a word of knowledge, through a, a gift of the Spirit today, all you have to know is that Jesus is in the boat with you. That that's where the calm is going to come from, even though the storms are raging all around you. Because this demonic man saw the power of God when he put those demons into the hogs. Of course, they ran all over the cliff and, and they, they died. And the people in the, the surrounding community, they were telling everybody about it, but they were angry too. They asked and bid Jesus to go away. We find that the demonic man is at his feet. Now realizing the power in Jesus, you know, a lot like Mary. Mary realized the power was at Jesus' feet. This demonic man goes to his feet and he says, he wants to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, no, go back and tell other people. He used a demonic man that had a thousand demons. That's power. You think that the storm ceasing and calming down was the real miracle. I think the real miracle is what he did for this man's life. And what he's doing in your life, you may not see today. You may say, calm it down, make me feel better. And he may give you that today. 
But what you have to realize is down the road, across the sea, someone else, you're going to be ministered to because you have to remain in the boat. That's the main thing. So many people want to abandon ship. I've seen people go back. I told someone this week again. People that, that go through struggles, they go back to the thing that is most comfortable. Now, I didn't say the thing that's best. They go back to things that they're used to. They know what to expect. Even if it's painful, they know what to expect. And they go back to it. But Jesus is saying to his disciples here, he's admonishing them, and in a way he may be rebuking them. He's saying, stay in the boat. Stay in the boat because I'm in the boat. The trials of your life, I, I put up here on the screen, they're, they're mercies in disguise. Here in the 25th verse, he says, then he asked them, where is your faith? Wouldn't that kind of bother you if Jesus had to ask you that? Where is your faith? His disciples at one time says, pray for us that, that we'll regain that faith. Pray for us that we'll have faith because we need it. The disciples were terrified and amazed. They were both terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They ask each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the sea obey him. You know, I thought about in 1998, I was in a private jet flying into Raleigh, North Carolina, or I was in those Blue Ridge Mountains or the, the Smoky Mountains, whatever that ridge is right there. And I've been on planes a lot, and I, I've talked to you about, you know, what God delivered me from and, and alcohol and things, so I don't need to go there. But all I can tell you is the, there were six other executives of Honda Motor the president, different senior vice presidents and Japanese, and there was one other American in there. And they were all totally inebriated. You know, from Columbus to those mountain range, you can, you can consume a lot of alcohol. And there arose up a storm, much like the Sea of Galilee, or as I said, Gennesaret, depending on the translation you're reading. And I remember watching them party and laugh. And you know, in a way, I was kind of like, why am I here? Why do I have to be with this drunken group? You know, they, they knew that I didn't consume, and, and, and so they were okay with me, but I wasn't okay with them. Because after a while, you know, it just becomes, get me out of here. And I remember this storm came up, and they told me, I don't know, I think 40 knots is, or 50, they it were 50 mile an hour winds, is all I know, coming through in those mountain ranges. Hot, cold, remember. Spinning. I have been in planes that have gone up and down and dropped, you know, a large degree. But a private jet sometimes does different things. But I'd never been in one that went like this, sideways. It was, I mean, it was, you talk about fish tailing on ice. That plane continued to do that. And I watched six men sober up like I've never seen somebody sober up before. I watched eyes totally dilate big, 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 big. I think the disciples were like this. I think their eyes became like that. They were inebriated in themselves. But I believe that these other ones, they, I mean, they, they strapped in and they, they were tight and I mean, they were scared. And I remember almost obnoxiously and almost ungodly in a way, in a way, I remember looking at them and thinking, you are so fortunate to be riding with me tonight. <laughs> You know, I just accepted the call in the ministry at that time. And I knew what God spoke to me. And I realized God wasn't finished with me because he was just beginning something new in me. That he was taking me eventually from the corporate world into the ministry. And I remembered, you are so fortunate you're writing with me because God isn't finished with me yet. And you're going to live. I got to believe that Jesus looked at his disciples like that, you are so fortunate that you're riding with me. That it's mercy of God. It was the mercy of God, I believe, that those executives were riding with me. I do. I mean, that's not, maybe it is obnoxious. I don't know what it is, but it is confident. It's confident that a child of God knows when you know where you are, that God blesses others. It's mercy in disguise. I think Laura's story sings a, a, a tune. And I, I, 
I think I wrote it down here. I want you to listen to these words. I, are these uh, verses, lyrics? She says, we pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for family. Protection while we sleep. We pray for healing for prosperity. Are you with me? All of those. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. All the while you hear each spoken need. Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea. And long that we'd have faith to believe. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? And what if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can't testify or satisfy? And what if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights, are your mercies in disguise? Do you know you're almost cursing at times the things that God is placing and putting in your life? I'm not saying that he causes disease. He doesn't cause the bad, but he allows and he works through the bad. What Satan means for bad, he changes to good. You know, I was listening to that song on the boardwalk in Virginia when God spoke this message to me that this is where I want you to go. And he took me to the actual scripture that I read this morning. But I want to conclude where he took me later this week. And I believe it's the eye of the storm. It's that calm spot that God wants to place us in at times to where we can be refreshed. There's an image of an impending storm coming to this earth like mankind has never known. And it's found in the book of Revelation. In chapter 4, it's not here on the screen, but in chapter 4, we see a beautiful scene of the church how they're worshiping. The rapture has taken place and we're worshiping. And by chapter 5, we see that the Lamb of God is the only one worthy to be able to open the scroll. But things start to change and the forecast becomes more certain because something definitely begins to take place here in this next slide. It says, as I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals of the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice, like thunder, come. Here, Jesus is beginning to open up. You talk about a storm that's coming on this earth. Here are the, the four horses of the apocalypse. The four, that, as you know, the red horse, which is, or the white horse first is the Antichrist, revealing himself. The red horse, the war and death. And each one of these have death in them. The black horse, famine, and the pale horse, the disease. But then the fifth and sixth seals are open. And the martyrs, under there in that fifth seal, they're crying out that justice be done, that something be done about the things that have taken place. And they're under the altar there beginning to cry out to God. And then in that sixth seal where the earth is physically altered, where earthquakes and mountains are removed or in, and shuttled along, along with the sun being darkened and the moon turned to blood and the earth, you talk about the sea being rolled up like a scroll, it is totally rolled up. Then in chapter 7 here on the screen, we see a sun or scene once again shift to the heavenlies. I think of the sun and worship around the throne of God. You talk about the eye of the, th the storm. You talk about what Pastor Larry was talking about, about where you get joy and peace and contentment right in the very presence of God. It says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. You know, on Palm Sunday, Pastor Hall talked about that preview. 
Do you remember that? Where he was saying that what they did as they were going into Jerusalem was a foretaste or a, a preview of what was going to take in heaven. Right here it is. And they held branches up. I said, this is the real sun that's going to shine. This is the weather forecast that you want where well, there's just enough breeze and they could feel those from the palm leaves. And they were shouting with a mighty shout. Salvation comes from God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb of God. The presence of God, the eye of the storm. Here on this next slide, it shows in chapter 8, we see a moment of calm. I like a moment of calm, but this, have you ever noticed the calm comes just before the storm? On the back side of that storm, many times I think, have you ever seen a tornado or been involved around one? How many of you have ever been or had? Do you, do you ever notice how calm it gets just before those violent winds strike? Again, the eye of the storm is seen here in heaven. The, the waving and worshiping of God the, that I said, but here it says, when the lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about a half hour. Everything got silent. You know, the, the great tribulation has already started, but it's the halfway point. You know, I used to have a coach. I saw him again here in December. We had a renewal of our team after 40 some years. So you can know how old I am. I'm 60 years old, but I'll be 61 years old soon. And I can remember at halftime, if we were playing bad, I dreaded going to that locker room. You talk about clipboards. You know, he couldn't coach nowadays. They wouldn't allow, they, the, every school board would have had him, if, if you can't give a trophy out and give, you know, heating pads and everything else at halftime, you're in trouble. Now, I don't believe in the cursing and all that, but he did that too. But I'll tell you, there was a halftime speech that was not, like you, nothing you'd ever know. I can remember clipboards coming, not at me, but by me. And, and it was scary. And, and I talked to him about those. I said, you realize how you were acting like a child out of control? I said, all you had to do is tell us what you wanted, and we'd have, do, we'd have done it. But he, that's how he got the attention. But here in heaven, there's silence. There's no thing going on here except the great tribulations about ready to come. The wicked parts of the storm, the judgmental things, the seven trumpets are beginning to be let loose, but there's going to be silence for heaven in a moment. In the next slide, it shows that then the seven angels, the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast. I want to tell you, there's an impending storm. There's a se severe weather alert, whatever you want to call it. When there's a warning, it usually means for sure. There's watches, and then there's alerts, and there's kumbayas, and everything else, and there's, you know, meteorologists must not have to know very much, because they can be wrong 50% of the time, and we think they're accurate. When it says there's a 30% chance of rain, we all cuddle down and, and stay in, don't plan anything for the day. I think when there's 80 or 90% chance, I believe them, and then they still lie to us. But here in Revelation, it's a for certainty because the seven bulls are going to be poured out. It says, and the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast. The first angel blew his trumpet and hell and fire mixed with blood were thrown down to earth. One third of the earth was on fire. One third of the trees and burned and the tree and the grass was burned. It's going to talk about the death and the destruction and the people and the, the carnage and things that are coming. I want to tell you, it's worse than any hurricane or any tornado, it's going to be the real storm. But you know the good part is? We're in heaven. If you're a child of God, you're in heaven. But there are still those that are going to have to make some choices. You know, that great tribulation, if you can't stand today, if you can't stand in the, the trial that my cousin doesn't like me anymore, he hasn't spoke to me or she hasn't spoke to me, or I could take it to any family member. The doctor has said this. And you know what? In some of your cases, you've had some really tough diagnosis. But I'm telling you, Jesus is still in the boat. He's still in the midst of our storm. He's still there. He's guiding us. He is still the master of the wind. Peggy, I want you to come right now. The rest of the praise and worship team, you stay where you're at. It's bad. Sometimes I can pick on her at any time, any place, and she's okay with it. I think. 
But she sings a song. It's an old song. It's called, I Know the Master of the Wind. I Know the Maker of the Rain. He can calm the storms and make the sun shine again. I know the master of the wind. I want to tell you this one. I know the master. Do you know him? Do you know he doesn't sleep or slumber? He may have slept in that boat because he had a physical body that needed some rest because he had labored and he knew he was getting ready to fight a thousand demons. Now you think about it. Jesus knew. He prepared himself. Sometimes we walk into church. We're not prepared at all. We don't even know what we're facing. But worse yet, we go out into the world. We go into the workplace. And we're not prepared for what we're going to fight. When you come to church on Sunday morning, this is where he equips us. There's where he gets us ready for the storm we're going to face. You know the storm, there should be a place of refuge every Sunday morning when you come in here. I know you're here because God let me know you're here. You may have not been here before, but you're here for a reason. God's saying that the storm that you're going through, the things that you're facing, the discouragement you're facing, someone's let you down. The doctor has told you something wrong. Financially, things are not making and not adding up. And I'll just go a different direction for a moment. We'll receive the offering so I can tell you. If you're messed up financially, put the best things first. You honor God and realize it all belongs to Him. And maybe you need to tell God that today, I will... I'll stay long enough to text or do whatever I need to do to take care of that. There are right principles in God. But the one thing his disciples needed to know, that they needed to have faith. Couldn't they have gone over to Jesus and said, Jesus, I know you're here, and I know nothing escapes you. I know nothing is missing. But you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable right now. We know you're going to take care of things. We know that this storm is temporary. We know that we're not going to drown because you're the master of the wind. But if you could, could you make it a more, little more comfortable for us by doing it right now? Quickly, if you would, please. Wouldn't that have displayed a little bit more faith? You know, the Word tells me that when things are right in my life, I can go before the throne of grace. Open. I don't order God to do anything. But I can go before Him and say, I'm your child. This is where I want you to come to this morning. As Peggy sings.